Patrick C. Please do it this morning. Amen. Just a praise report. My daughter's dog was less stressed for the last couple of weeks. So that's good. And um, I still like care for her to get a better job. Anybody else? Let's pray for uh, Francis and Tyrell. Baptized on Sunday. Lord, you establish them. Um, that's also and, also, great. and also Chris, too. We love Chris. having long hair. Yeah, yeah, Chris. He comes every Sunday. Yeah. All he wants to do is go to the gym. Yeah, Chris needs, needs to have uh, some direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's also pray for this Sunday that the Lord would bless the service. And uh, camp meeting coming up. Is anybody planning on going to camp meeting here? Right. Of course. Right. It's great. Praise God. Praise God. We're, we're blessed to have brother and sister answer with us tonight. So we're going uh, we're gonna to pass over to them fairly soon. But let's just lift up our voices in prayer. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, God, for your truth, God. We love you, Jesus. Reach down and touch God. As we put our needs before you, God, we see every heart, every need, God, every situation and circumstance, God, please touch and minister and bless. God, we pray that you'd work miracles and more than healing and God, let the Spirit of the Lord bring increase, God, and blessing, God, as we pray to you, as we lean on you, Jesus, please do your great work, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, touch God, strengthen Jesus. We give you the praise, God, and the glory, and the honor, and the worship tonight, God. Touch God, this camp is coming up. We pray that you bless us. Mr. needs and situations, God, we pray for your will to be done. Precious God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for it, God. We praise you for it, God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, we love you, Lord, we love you, Lord, we give you praise and worship tonight, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you care for me. In such a special way, so I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you.
check to see if it's on. Oh, uh, me and your pastor discovered uh, that we're not as young as we used to be. We even played a couple, uh, well, we played five sets of tennis over the last few days. and <clears throat> So if you see a, a, an occasional grimace come across my face, it's not because I'm struggling with the Word of God, it's uh, because... He did a, a little drop shot over the net, and I just I had to get to that drop shot, and I I took that last step, and I shouldn't have taken that last step. I should just let the ball bounce. So now I'm paying the price for it. So, and uh, age has a way of catching up with us, doesn't it? When you're running for something, you think you're 24, and then you you don't get there, and you realize you're older. Amen. You know, one of the uh, one of the things in in living for God and in um, in pastoring, of course, you get to get deal with all kinds of the situations of people's lives, and everybody's got a story. Uh, everybody's got. And if you'll sit down and ask questions or listen uh, to the background of just about any person in the church that you or anybody you come in contact with, everybody's got a story. There is heartbreak in everybody's life that you would never dream of sometimes when you see them and see them face to face. And the brokenness in our own lives from maybe a bad uh, upbringing, I, I mean, pick, a, pick an option. And uh, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the deep things that happen to us in life, and I talk about the deep hurts and the, uh, the deep pains that happen to us in our life, uh, happen... Um, because of choices that are made, our choices and other people's choices. That's pretty simplistic. Uh, but it's what is inflicted on us, perhaps, by the choices of somebody else. Or it's something that we do. It's a bad choice we make. And it doesn't just hurt us, but it impacts uh, the, the people and the lives around us. Uh, this lesson that I'm going to share with you today uh, is a lesson uh, taught to our church uh, a month and a half ago or so. and uh, But the, the core of the subject is such a, um, a foundational piece to living victorious and living as free as we can from bad choices and bad effects and patterns that we've started in our life. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 119, verse number 9. And uh, I'm just going to read a couple verses from this passage. Scripture. Uh, Psalm 119 says, let's wait for a moment for you to get there. Everybody there? Amen. Say amen if you got it. All right. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me want, uh, wander not from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart. And you can probably all quote this. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I, say it with me, that I might not sin against you. Uh, sometimes we can gloss over these passages really quick. And, uh, and, and though we... we we pull out the surface principle, we miss the power of what's behind this. So I don't know if, you have, if any of you are um, accident prone. We were in a bakery uh, this afternoon, and uh, the lady had uh, served up the, the donuts, and she was on her way with a glass plate across the, the back of the, behind the counter, and all of a sudden the, she stumbled or whatever, and the donut went flying off onto the ground, and that a beautiful piece of uh, bakery ended up on the ground. And I didn't know how beautiful it was until after we ate another, uh, not that one, but another one uh, of the same kind. Uh, and, and so we had a good, good laugh about the accident. But accidents happen all the time. Uh, spills. You're out to dinner and you spill spaghetti sauce on your dress or your shirt. My, all of my uh, uh, undershirts, my white undershirts, have coffee stains on them. Uh, because when I pray first thing in the morning, 
Uh, I just have my, my undershirt on and my coffee always spills. I, I can be walking perfectly smooth and somehow that liquid that is tranquil all of a sudden jumps. Like it is, it, I didn't even understand the physics behind it, to be honest with you, because it's not like I shake or hit something or whatever. It'll just jump right out. And, and so I have stains and all my white uh, dress shirts. And of course, I'm sure you've had occasion over the course of your life to have that. I know, uh, I know Josiah has never done that. Uh, never, never spilled anything uh, in the house. Uh, grape Kool-Aid was the thing that was famous in our house when I was growing up. That spilled, and you can't get those stains out. Uh, kids are not allowed to drink Kool-Aid anymore from all the health things that are out there that have been told. But never, I'm still alive and kicking, so I don't, I don't know all the things they tell us that are not good for us. I, I have no idea if it's right or not. But stains, uh, the subject is. Uh, how to break out of a rut is what we're going to talk about tonight. And there are these things that we call stains that might seem unrelated to rut, but I want to show you something from this scripture. Those seemingly impossible stains, blood, ketchup, coffee, ink, ring around the collar for guys with white dress shirts. And the question is, how do I get rid of stains? It's going to be one of the most Googled uh, uh, questions out there, I'm sure. How to get coffee stain out of white undershirts. What can I use to remove the spot? Is there a magical cleaner that will do the trick? And as we look at our text today, we'll see that the psalmist is asking a similar question when he says, how can a young man cleanse his ways? So You have your, uh, your paper there in front of you. I'm going to uh, kind of give you a clue when it's uh, a blank for you to fill in there. But this is the first one. How can a young man cleanse his way? This is a question that some people have never asked for themselves. Um, they don't like how they feel. They don't like the position that they are in their life, but they haven't asked, how can a young man cleanse their ways? This is a question that many have never concerned themselves over. And so today, if you've never asked your quest, this question as a Christian, if you've never uh, thought about how to break out of a rut, I want us to all ask, ourselves, not just how can the young man cleanse his way, but how can I cleanse my way? So why do you think, and I'm going to ask you this question, and if you got an answer or two, I'd like to hear back from you. How, or why do you think the psalmist asked the question of the young man in particular? Because he himself was a young man, and he did see other young men going down the path of destruction. Okay. Um, it's a natural thought that how can a man cleanse his way? Okay. And did you address that? Okay, so maybe when he's writing it, so he's in that place of life where he's having to ask questions of himself as a young man? The young man doesn't have the experience that older man has. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Maybe, maybe the, older, uh, the older person, hopefully, the older person has gained some wisdom uh, and knows how to. To, to cleanse his ways, knows how to get rid of that ink stain or that coffee stain. Yeah, sure. Great. Anybody else? Maybe one more. All right. The answer scripturally uh, from the scripture tells us not only how a young man can cleanse his way, but also how the old man can cleanse his way. And we'll kind of put the two answers that we got uh, from our two brothers together here, and we'll, we'll kind of, this is what the scripture's talking about as well. The older man is spared a lifetime of grief if his younger self deals with the seeds of sin before they take root. Our brother's talking about, you can see the trajectory maybe of somebody's life, of a young man's life and the way that he's making decisions and the types of decisions that he's making, right? So the, the younger self can deal with the seeds of sin. That's another blank in there uh, on your paper. The seeds of sin before they take root. If the younger man, and this, this is what we're, we're trying to just stop the process right now, is if the younger man waits to deal with his sin, then the seeds of sin become a forest of patterns and habits that can be impossible to root out or feel virtually impossible to root out. If a man or a woman develops a pattern of surrendering temptation to temptation, the seeds of temptation will grow. 
and they will produce the end result of temptation given into, and of course, that is death. Sin and sin works death, right? So every time we surrender to that temptation, a habit is built. Or is at least begun. Those habits are more and more in some, you all can probably think of habits in your own life. I was actually thinking when I saw the coffee pot over there, and uh, Brother Eric sitting here as well, uh, when my habit of coffee drinking started uh, 20, about 20 some years ago, I had never really drank coffee before. And then we started drinking coffee all the time for the late night drives back from Prince George. Yeah, I think they've, they, it's their fault. All the money that I've spilt, <laughs> all the money I've spilt on, or spent on, uh, all the coffee I've spilt on my dress shirt, I mean, or my white shirts, all of that. <laughs> but that, those habits are more difficult to break the, the, the more that they are experienced. Okay? So when the psalmist says, how can a young man cleanse his way, the words his way come from the, the one word in Hebrew, which is the word orak. And that, re, that the word orak signifies a track or a rut. Like that which is made by the wheel of a cart or a chariot. My wife and I, um, we were in Turkey a couple years ago. And for those of you that maybe don't, don't realize in, the, in your history books that, that that was actually the center of the Roman Empire. Uh, that that uh, for a long stretch of time, and so you go out into the into the we were just driving along the coastline of the Mediterranean, and we saw a park went off into the park, and there were Roman ruins everywhere, like aqueducts and and all kinds of stuff. There were so many cool things, and it turns out that this little town would have been right where Paul would have stopped off on one of his missionary journeys along the coast of Turkey. Of course, it wasn't Turkey at the time. But one of the, one of the places, uh, Antalya is the name of, of, of one of the cities there. And in Antalya, there is a gate that uh, I think Hadrian, Hadrian uh, the emperor or the uh, Caesar, built. And he would come through the gates, and they built these huge gates for him to enter. He, he came to visit at least one time. And these gates were all, it was all stone all the way around the gates, and it was, just, and it was thick stone. Like, it had to be a couple feet thick, the, the paving stones in the gate, uh, uh, under the gate, but they were completely worn ruts, chariot ruts, in this stone. The stone was, is, is now at least 2,000 plus years old that was in the gate, but the chariots, for however long that, that city was active, there was enough traffic through the gates that it wore chariot wheel ruts in stone. Ruts can happen in anybody's life. It can happen to anybody where all of a sudden, by the grace of God, you wake up and you realize, oh, my word, I've developed a pattern by talking like this or acting like this or doing this thing that I don't want to be a part of my life. So he says, how can a young man cleanse his way? Uh, the reason the psalmist is concerned about the young man in particular is that the young man is the one that, as our brother mentioned, carves out ruts in the beginning, that will determine the tracks for the rest of his life. Uh, any of you that have done any four-wheeling uh, or anything like that, or uh, in trucks or anything, you get the ruts in the bush, and some of those ruts are, uh, you know, a, a foot deep or 16 feet or 16, 16 inches deep. Uh, and, and your truck, you can try to stay out, but if it's, it's slippery, the truck just slides right back down into the ruts, and you just end up going where other people have gone before. So, of course, we understand that it is not only the young man, but it is every person, no matter of age or gender, that will struggle with habits, uh, failures, patterns, and behaviors that are unproductive uh, or un we'll call unhelpful uh, habits. Uh, yet, we can often trace those habits that we struggle with now back to our earlier years where we allowed small things to be sown into our lives and into our spirits. One of the most destructive things that I see as a pastor, it tears me up when I, when I see somebody begin to go down this path, is somebody that allows bitterness into their life, and they slip back into that wound or that hurt, and it's a part of every conversation, and it's a part of every decision that they make, 
and they begin to make decisions that destroy their life. But it started with a track or a rut or a pattern uh, that was very small or it seemed insignificant perhaps at the time. And here's a principle that relates to the question, how can a, a young man cleanse his ways? How can I cleanse my way? Or another way to put it is, how can I get out of this rut, this auroch, okay? How can I break this pattern that I'm in, this cycle or this way of doing life, that I'm, the way I'm currently doing it right now? Well, we know that the way to deal with every temptation, every evil thought, anger, gossip, lust, envy, failure, bitterness, is not to have to deal with it after you've let it take root and grow into a forest but rather the moment that the anger rears its head, cut it off. The moment temptation entices you, shut the door. The moment bitterness begins to nag, deal with it right there. The longer you have to allow, the, uh, or the longer you give for the seed to grow, the more difficult it becomes to remove it. The more energy you have to spend to dig it up the more time it takes to eradicate it, the more people you have to go back to and apologize to and talk to to get rid of it, the more effort it is going to take in the end. The psalmist is illustrating an important principle when specifically inquiring about the young man. The earlier we deal with sin, habits, hang-ups, and failures, the better off we will be. When is the right time to deal with a bad habit? Today, yeah, right away, right? So here it is. The best time to deal with temptation is before it begins to grow, but the second best time to deal with it is right now. <laughs> because a lot of what we're talking about, the, lot of str the habits and the struggles that we're, we're, you're thinking of in your own life right now, it's already started to grow. The best way to deal with it is before it starts to grow. The second best way would be right now. Uh, but maybe for some of you, it's too late. You cast the seed. Now the seeds have grown up into a fork. Maybe you've let the seed take root instead of digging them up before it was too late. You planted them thinking, well, they're, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I can deal with this later. God will understand. And this is probably the biggest, the biggest thing we tell ourselves, the biggest lie that the enemy feeds us is God will understand. It's just a little seed. I'll get it tomorrow. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a little sin. But here's the thing about seeds. They're usually little. <laughs> Josiah, did you know that? Seeds are little. Right on. A seed, though, never gives up. 24 hours a day. It's working. When you're awake, when you're sleeping, the seed that you have planted is working to grow and express itself into a harvest. Have you ever gone to bed and woke up angry? You just woke up off. You didn't. Uh, you had no idea what it was right away, and then you remembered, oh, yeah, that happened to me yesterday, and you actually were angry when you woke up. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm just talking to myself. I don't know. That, some of you don't believe that this happens. You know, wake up the next day and you're angrier than when you went to bed. Well, seeds actually continue to grow all night, even while we're sleeping. Seeds have the ability to transform the, des the desolate wilderness into a beautiful garden. But by the same token, seeds also have the ability, depending on what seed is being sown, to transform a beautiful garden into nothing more than a thicket of weeds. Maybe you planted seeds long ago, seeds that were things like doubt, spiritual laziness, that's a big one, ungodliness, or just a pattern of bad decision making. Those seeds have grown into a forest, and that which seemed so small and insignificant in the beginning has grown out of control. And now, well, if we sit here in this room, or while you watch online, try as you might, you feel completely helpless to change what's going on right now. It feels like your habits are out of control. 
You've cut a few trees down in the past, tried a couple of ways to deal with it, trimmed the forest, a few branches maybe, cleared a small patch out, only to realize a few weeks later you're overwhelmed again by the vast amount of trees still standing and new ones springing up in the place of the ones you cut. Those seeds you planted in foolishness or naivety have taken deep root, and now you're wondering how to get a hold of them, how to beat that habit, how to kick that sin for good, how to release that bitterness. How can a young man be cleansed from his ways? How can I be cleansed from my ways? I've got some really good news for you tonight, and it's really pretty simple. In fact, the psalmist answers his own question. How can a young man cleanse his way? He answers, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Now before you write it off and say, I already checked that box. I want to take you a little bit deeper in that. There's a saying that can be found written in the front of some Bibles and it goes like this. This book will keep you from sin. And sin will keep you from this book. Just like the seeds of sin, or just like natural seeds, seeds of sin must be sown to take root. And so must the word of God be sown in your life to take root and begin to grow. Jesus likened the word of God to a seed in his parable of the sower and the seed. (laughs) The story, the parable we call it, we we name it in, in the title. He likened the word of God to a seed. Uh, And he said uh, in his parable, he's teaching us a seed is utterly useless so long as it is in the barn. It is utterly pointless so long as it remains in the bag. Haggai chapter 2 verse 19 says, is the seed yet in the barn? Is it still in the barn? So just like a seed must be planted, the word of God must be planted planted. And it's not enough for a seed to merely be planted. It must be planted in the right place. The psalmist gives us important insight about the seed of God's word. He says, thy word have I hid or planted in my heart. Now, too many people read the word in pursuit of some kind of intellectual understanding without ever taking it into their innermost man, into the heart. I want to impress somebody with what I know. Whether Maybe that's, I want to impress God while I know the word. The question is, is it in your heart? Has the word got in, has it been planted in the inner man? Atheists, atheists many atheists throughout history have read the word. Heathens have read the word. Intellectuals have read the word. Elites have read the word the word. Corrupt people have read the word, and yet there's still all of these things. My friend, my brother, my sister, the reality is the word only ever enters the mind, but not the heart if there is no transformation and no effect. I I know know people in our church, the church I pastor, that have allowed the word to get into their heart. And I know others that have stopped it in their mind. They can tell you what I just, they, I just preached, but they don't ever live it. There is never a transformation. Clark, a uh, commentator, said this. He said, if God's word be only in his Bible and not also in his heart, he may soon and easily be surprised into his besetting sin." So if a man only ever has the Bible in his hand, and I'd go to the next level, or in his mind, but it never gets into his heart, don't be surprised when the sin comes out in his life. If the word is not consumed into the heart, it is merely words on a page, and it'll be a seed that has been planted in the wrong soil. In the last century, uh, archaeologists found wheat and cotton seeds in some of the burial chambers that they've excavated over in the Middle East, 
And some of those seeds, maybe you've read about it in the news. It, uh, maybe you don't have the same news feed I do on your, on your Twitter. I, I, I like some of this uh, science-based stuff. But some of these uh, old seeds uh, were anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 years old. And they grew when they put them in the soil. They took these 2,000 to 4,000-year-old seeds, seemed like they should be dead, put them in the soil, and they grew. In fact, when you go to the modern city of Jericho today, well, uh, a lot of that area is full of palm trees. So you get a, you get a lot of these uh, dates and things that they're, they're growing and are coming out of, uh, out of Israel. But those, uh, those dates that are in Israel right now were not actually the original dates. They were known, Israel is known for having some of the best dates in the world. Uh, but the dates that they're selling now today, most of them are not original to Israel. But just a, a, a short time ago, they found some old seeds uh, in Israel of the original palms that used to grow there, date palms, and they, they, uh, they planted them, and guess what? They grew almost 2,000 years old from be, uh, yeah, almost 2,000 years old before the destruction of Jerusalem uh, and uh, Rome destroying that, that whole area. They grew. Seeds are powerful, but they have to be planted. They have to be hidden in the soil. It's interesting that the psalmist chooses to use the word hidden in our text. That word have I hidden in my heart. It gives us this, this idea that, uh, of the word being planted just like a natural seed, so we can't see what it's doing at first. All we know is we've taken it in. I don't know if, if you've got to that place, and if you haven't, I encourage you to do so through, through prayer and elevating the importance of the word in your life, whether that's uh, uh, being at church and in your morning time or your, your evenings when you've got time, to love the word and love what you're reading. Be, there should be a gratefulness and a thankfulness that comes from your heart. Thank you, God, for the word that I get to hold this and I get to hear what you're speaking into my life. The problem is, though, that most people get impatient with the word, with the seed. So they say, uh, Pastor Dumeresk, I've tried reading my Bible. I've listened to sermons. I've even memorized a couple verses. And nothing is changing. Well, just like a physical seed, the Word of God takes time to germinate and begin to bring forth fruit. And just like, that's in, in your germinate and bring forth fruit, and just like natural seeds, the Word of God requires some watering with prayer. This is not a religious exercise. Reading the Bible is not a religious exercise. It is life. When Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life, the Word of God is spirit and in life. He's pulling it from the black and white pages of a textbook and saying there's something different. This is a seed. It has the DNA that when you plant it and bury it and water it, so not just get yourself educated about what's in the text, but watering it with prayer, just like the natural seed, it will... Psalm 119, 97 says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. We can water the word by meditating on it. This means reading the word prayerfully and thoughtfully, not just skimming over it, not just trying to get your three chapters in in a day, but allowing the word to be watered in your life through thoughtful prayer. And as we do, just like the seeds of sin took time, even years to reap a forest, so too the Word of God will take time, but will inevitably grow. We've got to keep prayerfully sowing the seeds of the Word into our lives, and it will reap an eventual harvest. Those seemingly insignificant seeds that seem so small, so unimportant, but they hold the greatest potential for possibility and a miracle. Don't give up. Keep reading the Word. Keep declaring the Word. Keep memorizing the Word. Keep listening to the Word. There's so many opportunities to listen to the Word in dramatized versions and everything like that today that's available to us today. Keep talking 
about the word. Bring it into your conversations when you're talking with people. Not, you don't have to do it in a weird way. You can do, you can do it in, in, in a natural way as well. Just a principle. You don't have to reference uh, Ezekiel 23, 37 uh, when you're talking to your friend. You, know, you can just bring the principle into the conversation. Keep following the word, meditating on the word, pursuing the word. Start, and here's, here's the, why that's so important. Start uprooting your sin forest by planting new seeds. It's going to take time, but with diligence, watering, and nurturing, you can begin to see a new harvest because the seed of the word, this is so important to understand, the seed of the word is the most powerful force in the universe, in creation. It will uproot old habits. It will uproot powerful sins of pattern, bad patterns and decision-making when you begin to allow the seed to be planted. Plant it even where you have other seeds already growing. You know, one, one, of the, one of the greatest uh, uh, shortcomings of so many self-help books is that it's your self-discipline. It's your ability to start getting it right through, uh, 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 through forcing your will to do th uh, things that you don't like to do. Where here, the psalmist is saying that a young man can cleanse his ways or get out of his rut or break these patterns by adding to his life instead of the impossible. And you guys, have, I, I'm sure you've tried this in your own life. Tried to become more disciplined, tried to become a better person, and you make resolutions every January 1st, and I'm going to do better at this, and you end up falling or failing. The psalmist is saying, I'm not asking you to try to get rid of everything in your own strength. I'm saying if you start by adding, adding to your life the seed of the Word of God, it will begin to push these things out of your life. It might not happen overnight. This is not a promise that you read a, a chapter tonight, everything's going to be perfect tomorrow. This is keep adding, keep watering the seed that you plant in your life, and it'll begin to push some of these other uh, seeds that are not near as powerful out of your life, breaking those habits. Start small. So, okay, where do we start? How do I grab this and, and begin? Start small. Learn one verse a week. Make up your mind that today you're going to start reading the Bible just five minutes a day. It doesn't have to start huge. I don't know if any of you have uh, ever worked out or played tennis, but you don't need to play five uh, sets in, in, uh, in two days if you haven't played tennis in 30 years, more than a set. Right? That's probably not the smartest thing to do, or you're going to pay the price. <laughs> right? Listen to a sermon once a week while cooking dinner or on the job, if, if your job allows you to have uh, earbuds in. Talk about a verse that stood out to you around the family dinner table this week. Discuss a verse that excites you with a brother or a sister. These are simple things. Just once a week do, doing that kind of thing and start to make it part of your new pattern of doing life. You might not have got rid of all the old habits yet, but you just start adding some of these things. Go into Bible study. I know that there's a lot of people right now that are more comfortable during COVID, they got really used to just staying at home because it's far easier than getting in your car and coming all the way to the church house. But there's something that happens when you're with the people of God and you push yourself to the next level, just adding one more thing to the process of allowing the word of God to germinate in your life. Start a Bible study yourself. Hey, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Well, let's study the Bible together. Find somebody else, another brother or a sister or a person on the job, even better, somebody that doesn't know the Word of God yet and start a Bible study with them. Small seeds that will reap a huge forest one day. The Word of God is the most powerful seed you can sow and it can't help but bear fruit. Why? Because remember, seeds are persistent. Seeds never give up and they work day and night. We mentioned that at the beginning. Even when you're sleeping, the seed, now we're not talking seeds of bad habits. We're talking about the seed of the word of God. The seed you have planted is working to grow and express itself into a harvest. Because if you've invested the word of God the day before, you don't have to wake up angry, disappointed, discouraged. You wake up not realizing, man, I've got nothing going for me in life. And 
but I'm happy this morning. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been there. Uh, even when you're sleeping, the Word of God can be working in your life. And the thing about a seed is that as it begins to grow, it will push up those dirts, rocks, debris, as it seeks to do what it was made to do. What it was made to do. You don't have to cultivate the seed and form it into something else. You just allow the Word of God to do what it was designed to do. Displaces things around it. A seed seeks to bear fruit, and that's because it's built into its nature. So it'll push obstacles aside to become what it was intended to become, and so too will the Word of God begin to do what it was made to do. It'll naturally push out the things of the world. It will naturally push aside that which stands in its way, and it'll seek to overcome the debris and the obstacles that stand in its way of growth. I know you have walked down sidewalks where tree roots are growing under those sidewalks. A tree didn't care that somebody had planted a sidewalk there. <laughs> it was going to do what it was designed to do. That little green that comes out of that, the middle of that concrete slab somehow, the smallest crack, doesn't look like water could barely go through, and there's a, a weed growing up out of that, out of that crack. On that rocky face in the mountains, you drive through the canyon of, of northern British Columbia. Trees growing. How? Because one day a seed landed there. And there was enough soil, there was enough moisture, that it germinated that seed. And that seed began to do what God, 8,000 plus years, however, wherever you think the world, the world began back then, uh, it... it it is doing what God determined that every, here's, here's the key, every tree, every seed will bring forth after its own kind. Isn't that powerful? That's what God built into creation at the beginning. He designed every tree, every seed to bring forth so don't be surprised when you start adding the Word of God to your life and watering it, when all of a sudden your habits start to change and you become uncomfortable with doing life. So it's not about trying to get rid of the bad habits, but now you don't want those. You're uncomfortable enough with them that you say, why would I be doing that? I want to do what's right. Why? Because the seed of the Word of God is bringing forth after its own Kind. And the cool thing is, just like that tree that can be planted on the side of that rocky cliff, the Word of God can be planted in a heart. Sometimes a hardened heart. Sometimes a heart that has a whole lifetime of bad choices and bad mistakes. And you say, God, I'm going to plant this. I don't see how this thing is going to grow. I don't see how I've got anything to offer this seed but you plant it anyways, and you just water in prayer, and the Word does what it was designed to do. It brings forth after its own kind. I don't know where I read it, but it's some philosopher that's super smart. But there is no way that you or I could ever carry a Douglas fir tree that is fully mature. Unless we can carry that tree when it's a seed, it's impossible to ever carry. And if I'm carrying it when it's a seed, that Douglas fir tree, not when it's mature, but when it's a seed, I can carry a whole forest in a bag slung over my shoulder. Seeds will become a forest if we allow them to be planted, the bad habits, the bad choices. We keep those seeds on the shelf, and we start adding the seed of the word of the Lord to our life. Do we want to know how the young man can cleanse his ways? It's not complicated. The starting point is not complicated. Want to know how you can cleanse your ways? The word is the answer. The word is the antidote. The word is what cleanses. The word is what removes stains. The seed 
is effective. The Bible tells us that it is the word that does the converting of the soul. It is the word that does the converting of the soul. That's why you speaking the word to your coworkers. That's why you speaking the word to your lost family members. That's why even the word being spoken into your own life is so important. Is it because it is the word that does the converting of the soul, the changing of the hardened ground into broken up ground, into, into uh, uh, productive soil. There is power in the reading and hearing and studying, and I'm, I'm wrapping up with this. There is power in the reading and hearing and studying of the Word of God that goes beyond intellectual benefits. It doesn't only change the soul, but it entirely converts the soul. Do you want transformation? Do you want change? Do you need deliverance over habits, sin, anger, bitterness, laziness, doubt, or fear? Start with the Word. Read the Word. It converts the soul. You don't have to be the wisest person, the most well-read person in the world to break your habits, to kick the, the, uh, the, out of the rut, and to, uh, to begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit of God. I finish with this illustration. A critic once wrote a letter to a magazine saying, Over the years, I suppose I've gone to church more than a thousand times, and I can't remember the specific content of even one sermon over those many years. What good was it to go to that church a thousand times? The next week, someone wrote back and said, Over the past many years, I've eaten more than a thousand meals prepared by my wife. I cannot remember the specific menu of any of those meals, but they nourished me all along the way, and without them, I would be a much different man. <laughs> you might not be able to identify everything that's happening in a moment from the Word in your life, but keep watering the Word, and it will produce the fruit it was designed to produce in your life in the process of breaking those harmful habits and patterns you've set. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it that you have put it in our hands. Father, sometimes we take these things for granted and, and we, we pass the Bible sitting on the coffee table and we don't ever think about what we're holding or what is sitting in our living room. God, I pray that there would be something that is stirred up here tonight, God, that would get down into the hearts of every person gathered here. God, that there would be a new determination, a new dedication to sowing the Word of God in their hearts and in their lives. I pray that you would help us to hide it. Help us to do what we, maybe, maybe we're out of the stage of a young man, but we can still begin today to apply those principles. Cleanse us of our ways. Help us to break out of these ruts, God, and help us to get your Word into our lives and do that in the process. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.